Chris is probably going to have to pull an all-nighter tonight. So if you I usually can't right go to now. sleep till 2.30 on these nights because, look, I'm too charged up. My brain, brain's flying. Yeah. So if Brian's in there talking to the other room. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Oh, yeah. What's up, everybody? It's Chris Sims. It's Chris Sims Unbuttoned. Ahmed Farid is here as usual. We are presented by Lowe's, and we are grateful to have them as our sponsor. My brain and my Brian are <laughs> feeling a lot better today than compared to 12.30 a.m. Monday morning, uh, certainly, but doing good. How are you, buddy? Good. Good? You what, recovered? Yeah. What kept you up all night? My Brian. My Brian. Oh, my no. Brian. Again? What was it, he doing? Uh, it, it really does. Every Sunday night, it keeps me up because, yes. I mean, you you get all these thoughts going on, and you know how I am. I can't do anything other yeah. than like pedal to the metal when I go. And then... When I get home, I'm a little bit like, oh, I got to get up and talk to Florio the next morning. Oh, so yeah. then I like think about, oh, I should have said this on the pod or wait, was there something in this game I missed? And I literally go to sleep talk thinking of matchups and then I usually don't sleep that quality. And then yesterday I'm in a fog. That's how my, you know, my Monday usually works. I feel like I don't wake up out of a fog until about two well, in the a, I mean, because you, you got college football now on your plate yeah, on right. the weekend. And yeah. so it's a, it's a full weekend of football on your brain the full whole time. Full weekend of football. Glad to see you brought the water bottle. Glad to see yep. you got your Detroit tie. Tigers baseball uh, sweatshirt on. I'm pumped for my Tigers. I mean, this is gravy for them right now. They they weren't even supposed to be here. Right. And now, who who knows? You beat the Guardians, and then maybe your Yankees face them in the ALCS. set up for the Yankees. I mean, if there's a year we can do it, we dominated the NLAL Central the whole season, and now it's three (laughs) AL Central teams. So I I hope we can do it. We'll see. We'll see where it goes. But, yeah, enjoying a little fall, October baseball. And then, I mean, of course, this is the best time of the year for football. It Mm. smells of football in the air in the northeast it feels like it finally it's been warm yes Yes. it's been a little warm it's it feels good right now it feels like football it feels like football we got october baseball this just feels right and so of course every wednesday now we've got the pick six six topics that we have hand selected the homies have given us some suggestions of what to talk about we'll go through some of the homies picks at the end of this we do the playoff predictions each and every year and some homies are are spot on Uh, right uh, now i'm I'm not feeling good about anything i've done right now i am cold as ice picks everything my Jet Super Bowl team. I'm feeling like that might not actually Don't give happen. up yet. Don't give up yet. Well, if they get there, it won't be with Robert Sala. That is number one <laughs> in our pick six. Whoa. The Jets have fired their head coach. He, I always think every year, I was like, I kind of want to do that. The pool of which head coach is going to be fired first. But then I'm like, well, that's kind of crappy. Yeah. Like root for something like right, that or right. try to get it's it. very Florio of you. Exactly. That's, that's something so, he would do. But in, mentally, I'm doing that. And mentally, I would have done the other New York coach, honestly, Brian Dayball. I would have been would, like, if they start out before slow. Before the year, you would have picked him of. to be the guy. Yeah. And so I'm I half it. right. It I was New it. York here. Yeah. So right. JD's burner right. wants to start off this conversation, and we'll let him. Uh, nah, it's all on Robert Sala. This is sarcastic. Totally not on JD, Joe Douglas, the GM, for trading for a guy who doesn't even want to play for the Jets and firing Sala's hand-picked offensive coordinator and drafting Zach Wilson. So Robert Sala fired. Yeah. Deserved. Yeah. There's a lot there. Um, where do I even start? Is it deserved? No, I don't think so. I mean, listen, I understand we can question it in totality what he's done to this point and go, well, it's been underwhelming. I understand that. But two and three and having a chance on Monday night to be first place in your division if you beat the Buffalo Bills, yeah, I think that's a little rapid in, in as far as coming to the conclusion that he's not the guy and the right guy for the job going forward. It's only five games into the Aaron Rodgers experiment. So you have to treat it like it's a new year there too as well. They're tinkering. They're figuring out how they want to play, do that, right? I look back at the years of like Brady with the Bucks. The first year they were 7-5. and five. It was like, man, are they going to make the playoffs? I don't know. It looked ugly. And then all of a sudden it got to like week 13 and 14. We started to go, hmm, this looks like the old Tom Brady all of a sudden. And then we got to the playoffs and all of a sudden we are like, oh, shit, he's on fire. Here we go. And we're going for the ride. And I wouldn't have gave up on that dream and that formula of what we have working there right at that moment. Now, where I'll say with J.D. Burner, all right, I don't agree with you totally there. I don't, right? Now, I know blame can go all around here for sure, and and Joe Douglas is not responsible for in totality of Aaron Rodgers taking over the organization, okay? That was the ownership, everybody who all went in on Aaron Rodgers and therefore made him king of the organization. And, yeah, they all do what he says to it degree I mean he's he's that big time of a blue chip type player right so they were willing to oh yeah you, you got your rules we'll do this for you yes I mean, when you're when you're that guy first ballot hall of famer that's what happens in those organizations now with the other part of that is you know I know he's getting on Joe Douglas but I would say too is it Joe Doug this is one of the best teams in football on paper and this is why 
the owner is pissed. And this is why you talk to anybody in football, they're going to tell you the talent on the Jets is phenomenal. It's phenomenal. So it's fair to place blame on Robert Sala for not getting the amount of talent or amount of uh, results out of this talent to this point, right. right? I get that, but does that mean I would fire him week five? No, it does not. So I know that you're yeah. well connected, and I know that you've talked about the Jets before. And yeah. So you, I'm, I'm sure you, you don't like to be break your newser guy, yeah. and you kind of let the dust settle sometimes right. before you start poking around. Right. But your gut, from from what you know about the situation, what do you think happened here? Why? I know. Why now? I have no, and I have no inside info here. Yeah. Right. And the Jets are they're on lockdown right now. Everybody's afraid to talk, say anything, have it traced back to them. Right. So I. I just and I put out a few feelers yesterday. I got very cold responses, right? Mm -hmm. So, and that's what I expected. This is something that, you know, I'll hear about more down the line, like you said. But either way, my gut, my gut tells me, right, from everything we've heard and connecting dots, one, owner, even probably Joe Douglas is like, what? We're two and three? I mean, it's an all-star defense. We got pretty good receivers. We got two damn good backs. Schedule wasn't terrible Schedule to start the year. Schedule wasn't terrible. Offensive line is better. So why aren't the results better, right? So I think there's frustration there right off the bat from the very top going right to Woody Johnson. Second thing that goes into, into this conversation, where did they just play? UK. Who was the ambassador to the UK under the Donald Trump presidency? Woody Johnson. You don't think he's got some buddies there that added to this like, hey, we're coming to town. We're really good this year. We're going to show you. We're going to show the UK. We're a Super Bowl yeah. team, blah, blah, blah. And then his friends were like, hey, man, what's wrong with hey, your man, football team? You guys aren't very good. That team in purple's better. <laughs> <laughs> so I do think there's the embarrassment of that that maybe plays into this or maybe the emotions of it to make it a little more hasty right but then we get into the things you hear and where there's smoke there's fire and again i don't know if everything's true but again you're asking my gut feel mm -hmm. here my gut feel is that they went into a staff meeting on monday morning he told the staff that Nathaniel Hackett wasn't going to call plays or do anything anymore, which, which, which first off, I want to be like, why is anyone blaming Nathaniel Hackett? This is Aaron Rodgers' offense. This is what he wants to do. Nathaniel Hackett wouldn't do just exactly this. I've seen his offense in Jacksonville and other places. This is not what he does. He does this to a degree. He believes in some of this, certainly, but he's doing this because it's around the prism of what Aaron Rodgers wants to do, right? So I don't like that, that people blame Nathaniel Hackett necessarily for all this stuff here. I know he deserves some blame, right? But this, again, goes into the organizational, we'll let Aaron Rodgers do whatever he wants. But my gut, to follow up on what I was saying, is that they told Nathaniel Hackett, you're not going to call plays or you're going to share duties, right? And he or somebody got out of that meeting, and called Aaron Rodgers and said, hey, they're demoting me. And then Aaron Rodgers called the owner and said, what the f*** is going on? And that came, that went to that decision. Hmm. I know Woody Johnson says he talked to him the night before. He might have talked to him the night before. He said he didn't talk about the coaching stuff at all. I find that extremely hard to believe that he, first off, that that didn't come up. There's no way. There, there's just absolutely no way. So either way, whether that conversation went down the night before or whatever happened on Monday morning – added to a second conversation, that is what my gut would tell me. I don't think Woody Johnson does all of this after what they've treated and how they've treated Aaron Rodgers, king of the organization. I don't think he does all this and doesn't run it by Aaron Rodgers and talk to him and talk and, and feel it out a little bit. There's no way. There's no freaking way that that goes down like that. So did Aaron Rodgers know about it? I'm sure. Did he get involved in it? I don't know, but my gut tells me yes. So normally when you see something like yeah. this, it's it's early in the season from a team that's probably going nowhere. Uh, maybe had higher expectations. We're right. like, well, this is a lost right. year. Let's fire the head coach. Let's start the process of bringing in someone else. We'll have an interim. This interim here is Jeff Ulbrich. Brick or Bridge? Yeah, Ulbrich. Brick. Ulbrich, you're right. Building one brick at a time. One brick at a time. But that's clearly not the case with the Jets. They, they think that Jeff can come in here and perform better than Robert Sala. I, I guess. Because they don't want this to be a lost year. That's why they made the move. I guess. I mean, Ulbrich is right from the same coaching tree and is here because of Sala and is basically an extension of Sala. So if they feel like maybe Sala lost the team in some ways and his message was being lost and that, then, then maybe. But I, I feel like the message is still going to be the same. I know Jeff Ulbrich a little bit. I know how he coaches and what he does. He's his mantra is going to be very similar to you know Robert Sala: all gas, no brakes, fly around, you know, play hard. We're going to hustle, do all that. I, I so I don't know where that changes necessarily, and he's in a tough spot too. 
You know, I know he made comments about, well, we're going to look at the offense. You're, they're not going to do anything unless they talk to Aaron Rodgers. I cannot imagine that Aaron Rodgers is going to be cool with, wait, we formulated all this and we worked on your offense and got everybody on the same page, and now it's week six, and we're going to go, Todd Downing's doing it now. Like, I just don't imagine Aaron Rodgers being cool with that. Mm -hmm. And so that, if, that's the, if that is what happens, I'll be interested to see how this plays out. And if there is a new formula on offense, which I think there needs to be, like I said to you on Sunday night, hey, all for it, certainly. But I, I still think Rodgers is in the know and a part of all these decisions for sure. Well, let's take a look at uh, the Jets' ranks yeah. defensively and offensively. So right. defensively, and, and Sala was the defensive guy with the, the 49ers. Yeah. I mean, the, here they have been elite. Their elite, their elite talent elite. has shown to be elite on the field. You see some of those ranks and the points allowed per game this season, tied for fifth. Yards allowed per play is first. So, I mean, this is a defense that can win a Super Bowl. It's one of the best in football, period. The only thing they don't do that you would like to see out of a defense this talented and elite, and, you've and we've talked about this before, is cause some more turnovers and stuff like that right because they kind of just do what they do that doesn't allow them to create a lot of turnovers but at the same time it's hard to do anything against the Jets we just talked about it on Sunday night too the Vikings have shredded every defense they played this year they couldn't they had a hard time getting first downs at certain points of the game against the Jets the Jets defense is phenomenal across the board Right? The Vikings played all those good teams, the 49ers, the Texans, whatever. None of those defenses can mess with the Jets. Mm. The Jets are phenomenal there. And, yeah, that's where it's a little weird, too. Now, I don't think they're going to lose anything on that side of the ball because Ulbrich is the defensive coordinator, and it's still the same staff, and it's still going to be the same message. So they're not going to lose much. But, yeah, for a defensive coach you know, to get fired in week five and the defense is thriving and the offense is – you know, behind the eight ball, and a little bit of that is because the whole organization has empowered Aaron Rodgers to be king of it. That that is where I go. Oh, that's a little odd to me to fire that guy right now. And here's been the frustration, yeah, the right. flip side of that. The yes. Jets' offensive ranks. We're going to compare Week Five, 2023, through Week One, Week to through Week Five from last year to the first five weeks this year. And there are improvements in some areas. Not in other areas. I mean, they have not rushed the ball at all with Aaron no. Rodgers behind center no. here. And so th this is this is the major frustration. So I'll, I'll, I'll ask you this. And or yards per play, right? Those yes. are the two things. And those go hand in hand to me. Because even with that, like Zach Wilson and other people, teams were scared of the, peop the Jets at least throwing the ball down the field every now and then. Right now, it goes a little hand in hand because they're just like, wait, Rodgers is going to hand it up the middle or it's going to be a short throw over the middle or a short throw in the flat, right? Or a little swing route to the back or Garrett Wilson on a little bubble route, right? So those two things kind of play hand to hand, and that's different. But I will say their offense is better this year. So There's let me no ask you this. Is yeah. there a path to even better numbers than this? I do. I do think there is. I do. Now, uh, again, I think there's got to be some tinkering done, and maybe they got to take Rodgers out of his um, comfort zone a little bit to go, hey. Who's going to do that? I, I don't know. That's where they got to sit down and try to figure out. And, and maybe last week and the fact that their offense hasn't worked the way they wanted to two weeks in a row mm -hmm. with ugly losses to the Broncos and the Vikings to where maybe he'll start to be a little willing to look at some new ideas or some new ways to attack. You've brought this but up I to me. I don't know if he will. You've brought this up to me in the past, yes. and I think you've mentioned it on the podcast yeah. too with Tom Brady. Yeah. It's not going well right. early on. He's right. making some mistakes. Right. Bruce Arians gives two nothings about nothing. Yes, he right? gets two <laughs> He does not give a <laughs> Right. Yeah, he, he does not. Yes, yeah, exactly. No. Right. Um, I was too worried about not swearing. Right I, know there. You I didn't were. know what to say. <laughs> um, but th there's no one in the Jets organization no. right now that has that no. kind of no. disposition. No, to there's, do that no, to Aaron there's nobody there. I don't think that I look at that can do that. To put the you know the hot poker as you and I always yes. talk about. Right. Just hey, hey, come on, hold the ball in the pocket. Be a little more aggressive. Do that. Right? So Aaron's going to have to come to this himself. I, I mean, I think to a degree, or it's going to have to be massaged by you know other coaches involved and see if they can get him to go there we'll see where it goes but as I said and as you heard me say it might look good when you play the Patriots and some of the defenses that are simpler and not as talented in the world the good defenses with talent and then a little creativity are going to be all over this Aaron Rodgers stuff all over I, I have no doubt about that and this goes back into what I told you during the quarterback rankings and even the preseason does Aaron Rodgers does can he play the way he thinks he can play and my answer at this point is no 
This is not Aaron Rodgers from four years ago who we're going to run these little simple plays and then still make incredible throws or get out of the pocket and buy a little time and then go, well, the play is simple and normal and he executed it great, but if it's not there, he's so amazing, he makes it work anyways. Those days are done. And that's where it has to change and hopefully he can do that. But yeah, he had Bruce Arians, Tom Brady had Bruce Arians poking at him and he had Bill Belichick. He had two pokers his whole life that were constantly, constantly like, you can do better, you can do better. I know you're the best in football, but you can do better. You, you know I'm what not I mean? scared of you. Yeah, I'm not yeah, scared you know, of you. Like... Exactly right. And that's the way good football teams function. Right. I mean, think about a dynasty. Do you know any dynasties where you're like, yeah, the quarterback was running the team, not the head coach, right? Yeah, yeah. You think Terry Bradshaw and Chuck Knoll? I mean, he was scared to death of Chuck Knoll. Joe Montana and Bill Walsh, he was scared to death of Bill Walsh. Yeah. You know, not my dad is not a dynasty, but just more examples. I mean, he was shit scared. He's still scared of Bill Parcells <laughs> to this day. Jimmy Johnson and Troy Aikman, you go through it, right? It doesn't matter. There's, the, there's got to be a boss and somebody that's going, I know what's best for our football team. I know you like to do this, but this is what's best for the team, right? And that is usually the greater good. Peyton Manning, his last year, he wants to throw screens and do all this and have great numbers. And, all, and they go, no, we're going to run the ball and be ugly and play through our defense. We're going to mm -hmm. win a Super Bowl, though. And I get you, bet you he's very grateful for that, even though it was probably a pain in the ass at the time. But that's the way it goes. And, of course, Belichick and Brady, we know – you know, how that hierarchy went as well. So another question is, who yeah. is the next head coach going to be? And that's why Whoa. this is a little weird, yeah. is because we're already kind of talking about next year, where the Jets <laughs> very clearly want to play for this year. But yeah. but who could the next head coach be? And so DraftKings got the odds to be the next Jets head coach. Oh, no. My guy Ben Johnson is taught. Take this graphic You're, off the screen. Ben's going somewhere no matter what. The way me, I don't know. Now Maybe he just the, loves the, being the, the offensive coordinator. The way my the lines. Bears got it going, I was like, if you asked me three weeks ago, I'd be like, oh man, Ben Johnson's looking like he's gonna be the head coach of the Bears next year, definitely. Oh. But that, I don't. The Bears got it going right now. We're gonna hit on them in a few minutes. You got some offensive coordinators, Bobby Slowick over there with the Houston Texans. I do find it intriguing. All brick. I mean, if they can make a run here, yeah. how could you not make he him could, the guy? Yes, that's right. I mean, they, he definitely has that in his favor if he can turn this around and get them playing good ball it's going to be inevitable the guy that jumps out is easy to me it's Mike Frabel mm. Mike Frabel's the best head coach on that that graphic right there he's the best coach in general I know everybody wants an offensive football coach and I get that but I look at and just go wait the guy's tried and true and proven and I think he's phenomenal and he's the perfect guy for a jet, the Jets and the New York media he's got a little of that Parcells Belichick about him he's going to be able to be a little cute and funny with the media he's also going to have his way of like telling them to shut the hell up he's going to be perfect for the New York Jets so that's the guy I would look at right now if I'm the New York Jets going in the future I should not put a dollar on Bill Belichick at plus 2,000 to go back to the New York I Jets I would be shocked I think Je Bill Belichick's hatred for the Jets is very real yeah. I don't think it's like something where it's like oh it was cute just because they were rivals for a little bit 15 million dollars later though he's like you know what they're well, not as bad as I thought let's see who else, off else offers him 15 million dollars a year later too you You'll, you'll see where it goes, but but no, I don't see that happening. I don't. I think that is a very real disgust with Bill and the Jets organization up to the point where, have you ever seen him and the two Bills, right, with him and Parcells? Mm. Like, they were at MetLife Stadium. They're going through their history and all that. They asked them to go in the Jets' locker room. He doesn't even want to go in their locker room, okay. right? So there's that's real. And he would have to do that if he was the head coach, which is the problem. Yeah, <laughs> You're so funny. Uh, DraftKings Sportsbook, the number one place to bet touchdowns, and new customers can bet $5 and get 200 in bonus bets instantly. Download the app and use the promo code UNBUTTON when you sign up. DraftKings King Sportsbook, Sportsbook, the crown. Is, is yours. It actually just says you there, so I didn't. It wasn't oh, you're right. Together, it does. Yeah, you know? Pete. I, to I want you to have your. Time. Maybe I take ownership of that you last line I now. You have your time. No, that's all right. We can you know? we can do that. You know, uh, Pete Carroll's he, another name. Let me throw that out there too. Okay. Pete Carroll. No, sorry. No. Okay. Sorry. He's already been know. the coach of the Jets too. I know. But no, and we don't. They, they, I don't. That's not what they need. I do know that he wants to get back into coaching. Though. Yeah. He would I, love to be. I, I wouldn't be shocked by that. I hear He'll, that he too will take fifteen million dollars to coach. Wow. These guys, they're they're so unselfish. All right, so we're gonna take a break here early on. Uh, early break here. We're just going to gather our thoughts. You yep. know, after after a firing, you got to just take a deep breath. Yeah. So we, that's what we're going to do. When yep. we come back, we got two stats and a lie. And what happened to your boy Blue? Nine of thirty? Was yeah. that the? Was yeah, that it was? You're oh my correct, gosh, Josh Allen. All right, yeah. we we'll talk about all that coming up next.
Every week, DraftKings sets up the free $1,000 Florio and Sims Pick'em Pool. Pick every game against the spread for a chance at a $1,000 prize pool every week, Chris. Draft, no, download DraftKings app, click on the Pools tab, and enter the Florio and Sims free $1,000 Pick'em Pools to make your picks. We want to see you win money. And welcome back to the Chris Sims Unbuttoned podcast Ooh. presented by Lowe's. Lowe's knows home improvement. Do you know what do- is a lie and what is not? I, I usually do. I'm yes. a pretty good like a, evaluator of people's faces and eyes when they I lie. I think so, yeah. Um, I usually know my stats. Pete, I am looking at this right now, so please don't unblack the answers yeah, there. Do not unblack these answers. So uh, this is how we'll do it. Two stats and a lie. Looking at them already and I'm nervous. I go I go perusing uh, through PFF right. and some of that. I'm like, oh, what, what stands? Stands out to me. What's yeah. interesting to Ahmed Farid, and I hope that that's interesting to other people. Uh-huh. So we'll see here. So these are two of them are true. Yep. One is a lie. So this Ooh. this week, let's try to identify the true ones first. So I'll okay. ask you uh, which one's true, which one you think is true. So we start with. I'll give you all three. Yep. The Vikings play the least amount of cover one in the league, which is man to man single safety. Oof. The Cowboys average the least amount of time between snaps on offense. Oof. And Caleb Williams has the highest percent of uncatchable passes of any quarterback who has started all the games this year. So two of those are true. One is false. Whew. Can you identify one of the two true ones right now? Well, it, 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 I don't know if I can right now. It's, it's, it's <laughs> to me, they're actually really close. Like, I, yeah. I think there's a little logic in all of them. Like, I know the Vikings don't play a ton of man-to-man. Right. Yes. But is it the least amount? I'm not sure. Right. Yes. This is a very difficult one so, because even the one that's false is close. It, it's close. Yes. Okay. Okay. The Cowboys average the least amount of time. They do a lot of hurry up and get to the line of scrimmage and do that. Is it the least amount, though? I'm not right? sure. That's true. It's tough. You're this very is a tough lawyer one. on me today. This you is a hard really, one. really like fine print on me. Right. And then Caleb Williams definitely has had a high percentage of uncatchable passes. Yes. But is it the highest? Yes. I don't know. This is, you're making great points here. I know. I know. So uh, one true one. What? What? All right. The Which first, one do you feel most confident? I think is number one. The Vikings play the least amount of. So cover that one. is true. That is, is true. true. So they okay. are four point two percent. That is just ahead of the Falcons, Chargers, and Bucks, who also play quite a bit of cover one. Right. Uh, in the league, Th- that does not surprise you. Yeah, that does not surprise me. I know it's heavy zone football team. They just dabble or a in, little bit. I'm sorry, a yeah. little, a least amount. The yes, least amount. Correct. Yeah, they dabble in man to man just every now and then to keep you honest. Or yes. when they just blitz, when they do finally blitz everybody, you go, oh, there's the man to man play. Right. So, all right, now most cover one by the way browns at 42 percent broncos at 36 well, percent. i'm not shocked by either one there right crazy in your face right this they both got very good secondary so they're willing to, to take those chances um all right the other true one i'm gonna say is caleb williams that one is the lie false ah. so we'll save that one but all the right. other one that is true is the cowboys it you were right to point it out yeah they do a lot of hurry up stuff yep. I, this surprised me though right so on average they have 12 seconds left on the play clock at snap that is the most in the league wow so the cowboys are moving at a higher pace than any other team I mean, in they, the nfl they do a lot of they get a first down they get up on the ball and they roll i mean they, they're not afraid to do it whenever it's second it's third and one they'll go the hell with the huddle let's try to get them real quick and just get them off in a frenzy and line up real quick and run a play right they're very good at that uh, any I, idea any idea who the i thought slowest you were team? doing reverse psychology I know, I was on me there to, you know I, okay before we move on to the last one do you yeah. have any, any idea who the slowest team is i know it's here don't look i know I, I haven't looked um so cowboys the fastest who's the slowest mm. oh oh uh Oh, my gosh, you're right. It's easy, actually. It's Aaron Rodgers. It is the Jets. Yeah. Average of about five and a half seconds. He waits seconds. to the last second every play. I mean, he waits the, the play clock to go down all the time. 74% of the time, they snap it with less than 10 seconds on the play clock, which yeah, is number that's one crazy. in the NFL. You're really helping the defense out when you do that, in that's my That's interesting. Opinion. Gives them more time. You do. You give them more time to settle in, think about what you're going to do, all that. There is something to be said about you know changing the pace, being a little quicker at the line of scrimmage, not letting the defense settle in and think about, wait, when they're in in this formation, I know my coaches like to do this. It's just like there's you know a little more of a frenzied feel for the defense when you hurry up. So you were very right. Caleb Williams was close to right. having the highest percentage of uncatchable passes. He was second to Josh Allen, wow. who is now at 25% last week. Certainly didn't went a long way yeah, into bet. adding to these numbers. We'll get to Josh here in, in a second, but you went into the notebook, yeah. into the barn, right. and looked at this this Bears offense, and Caleb Williams certainly has, has struggled early in the year, and you saw some frustration with some of the weapons on the offensive side. So you want to take a closer look at now that it was clicking against the Carolina Panthers. Yeah, I had you to. Were, you were 
you almost fell in love. What I feel like here I, I, a little bit. I do. We go inside the notebook, and there's an actual heart. There is a heart. Now at you the did end. you did spell there wrong. I That's never the wrong do the T H E I R. Never. Oh, it's, you just refuse never. to do it. Yeah, I refuse. It's you know. What I'm saying there it is. T-H-E-R-E. <laughs> so it's not even like, oh, I just got confused. It's just like it's not part of no, who I am. It's not part of who I am. I will never write T-H-E-I-R. It never. It's never coming out of my pen ever, 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 ever. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I've never heard that before. Yeah. Nah. Someone that opposed I to that can, spelling of the I'm word. I'm not thinking about conjugation and all this kind of stuff when I'm writing football notes. I'm just trying to get yeah. my damn thought out on a piece of paper. I don't think that's conjugation. <laughs> oh, yeah, that. Uh, uh, but okay. All right. But there's an. let's go back to the heart. Okay. There's an actual heart yes. and there is... Glowing, you know, mushy. Like I love this offense. I, I'm in, I'm in blown away. I mean, you you've heard me what I said the first two or three weeks of the year. They do nothing. They couldn't block anybody. They can't run the ball. They can't protect. The pass schemes and stuff are so simple. It's ridiculous, right? Last week I knew there was success and it was better. I watched, so I was going, oh, okay, hey, the Rams game definitely looked a little different here. But then I and I get so many questions about the rookie QB. So I was like, you know, I gotta watch this Bears game the last week because on TV I was like, it looked cool when I was watching. I was going, damn, I haven't seen them do that or that looks like a cool play. What the hell are they doing? One, I got to give Shane Waldron a ton of credit, the offensive coordinator. The offense, like you saw in my notes there, has everything. Tons of formations, hard to figure out or, or have a tell on what they're about to do. They're equal and underneath the center, they'll run it or run a play-action pass. You don't get a feel for either one is coming. When they're in the shotgun, it's the same way. I, it's not just doesn't mean they're in passing when they're in the shotgun. They keep you every bit as honest in the run game. You know how I always say there's a zig for every zag, right? You got to have some plays, okay? okay, this is our bread and butter, but you got to have like three plays off of it, right? That, okay, we want to run the play action pass with a Dunze running at a deep cross and DJ Moore running the, you know, deep post. Okay, now let's have the same play, but throw the screen to DeAndre Swift, stuff like that, right? And that's to me what great offenses do. And they really do that. And let alone they're shifting, they're moving, and you can tell Caleb Williams is getting more comfortable and confident. I mean, he makes some throws in the game that to me are, are eye-popping. Right, his arm, uh, his arm is so powerful. It's incredible. Mm. I mean, it's easy power. Like to the point, I'm not even joking you. At times, he throws the ball, and I'm like, I don't know. Is his arm stronger than Josh Allen's? I mean, wow. that's how strong it is. You think on the run, he certainly is on number the arm, one. On the run, he has the strongest arm in football, and that's saying a lot because there's dudes like Mahomes and Allen who I say have the strongest arms I've ever seen in my life. Really, up to this point, on the run. And, yes, I think he's got them beat in that department. Wow. It's like an optical illusion sometimes. The ball sometimes, when he really uncorks it, you're like, wait, did it really stay six feet off the ground for 25 yards and look like it's still accelerating when it hits the receiver? There's some of that. But such great rhythm and mixture within the offense, really awesome, and you can tell they're starting to feel it a little bit on, on that side of the ball. They're using everybody, yeah. all the receivers, Gerald Everett, Cole Komet, and then DeAndre Swift – look awesome the last two weeks and you haven't been necessarily a Shane Waldron Not fan huge. no no I but feel like I am I feel like you know I don't know if this is zebra flus the pressure of the situation sure. that they're going hey we got to unveil it a little bit we got to let it go we got to we got to sink or swim here or you're going to be fired and Ben Johnson's going to be the head coach so let's start looking some yeah, positive we, things here no one wants that I mean but I mean wow like really do it all and uh uh, really impressed, and 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 two, I, you know, we know DJ Moore is awesome. Romo Dunze even looks better too. There's a different gear because he's comfortable. Um, the offensive line, after the slow start, and I know it's the Rams in Carolina. We're not ready to write home about them being the steel curtain on defense or anything. I get that, but. I mean, there are some ass-whooping plays where they open up holes and push people around and dominate. So really, really encouraged from, from that standpoint for the Bears. And even when it was 27-7 uh, late, you noted there, they were throwing it around, they were feeling themselves, trying some things and getting I, in a rhythm I here. I think so. And, and, you know, those are good times sometimes to go, wait, it's 27-7, the pressure's off. Let's work on some stuff. Let's continue to get confidence and reps and stuff like that. I like that mm -hmm. about him and their offense and what they did. His movement is incredible. He had a touchdown run that got called back. He has a few scrambles that his quickness and ability to break arm tackles or make people miss in space, it's as good as anybody in the NFL. Like anybody, him, Lamar Jackson, 
the, he's better than Jaden Daniels in that department. He's not as fast as Jaden Daniels, yeah. but his ability to break you down and break ankles and he, make people... He does it in a different way, and I don't know if it's his flexibility. I, I know he's super it's flexible. It's something like that. Yeah. It, it really is incredible, but uh, you know, hopefully this is a, a sign of things to come for their offense um, because yeah, I, I, liked what it, I liked what it looked like as a whole, and yep. I liked how the players looked uh, individually as well. As noted, though, in two stats in a lie, has been a bit inaccurate at, inaccurate at times, so maybe we'll, he'll uh, start fixing that part uh, of the game. As well as he gets more comfortable here. And also, as noted there, Josh Allen is up there as the most inaccurate. Now, I do want to note, as we move on to number three in our pick six, we will talk about Josh Allen, what happened with the Bills. Um, He was mid-pack before this week. Before this week. Like this week brought him down right did you see that from your from your film watching was it josh allen missing guys or was it a whole offense that was struggling no it's he missed some throws he was off his game with his mental clock early on in the football game Hmm. he i I do think he predetermined a few times and went oh i don't think this guy will be open and it was like they drop back and you're like no this was your first read and he was open and you got off of him too quick thinking they were going to take that away so, yeah, the first half of football was not good. And then with him, too, at, at times, of course, because he tries to make every play work, right, to where, okay, now we – I might have missed the first read. Now he extends it and he's trying to let somebody get open. And then he has to throw it away or throw it in a spot where nobody can get it. So that's going to add to these, like, off-target throws sure. that are uncatchable, right? His, his, you know, trying to make every play work with his magical athletic ability. But uh, in the game as a whole, you know I don't love their offense, okay? You know that. I don't love their talent. Everybody knows that, okay? And then this was a game where he missed throws, especially in the first half, and definitely missed some reads in the first half where you go, hey, just stay on your guy here. He's about to be open. And that could have maybe changed at least the way the first half went, and they wouldn't have been down 20-3 to and maybe a little bit more competitive to where, you know, they wouldn't have to come back the way they did in the second half. Sam Bradshaw, 33, says, first time talking about the Bills this year on the Pick 6 podcast. Great timing. So I think he's upset. Now that we picked this game, the 9-30 of game for Josh Allen to dive into the film. But it's so unusual that you had to figure out what actually happened here, and this is a trend of things to come. Matt King says, what do you think the Bills should do more of on O? I think they need more motion, like in the first few games, need to trust Cole Coleman down the field more. We've got a whole bunch of screenshots yeah, to kind of illustrate do. your points of what they need more of, what Josh needs to do more of yes. here. Yeah, um, we'll, we'll show that. I think, I mean, I don't disagree with what the, what the what's being said there by our mm-hmm. listeners, okay? The other thing is, yeah, they do need to do more shifts and motions. One, because of, as I say, and this game would be another game that would confirm it, they, these teams have no fear of the Bills' weapons. So they got to find some ways. They can't just line up and go, our guys are going to beat them lined up. They're not, it's not going to happen. You know, it, it, it's pretty simple to see. The Texans were like up in their face, like mano we mano, and we're not worried about anything. Okay, so there's all of that. You know, getting into just the real quick before we start to show some of the pictures, yep. right? Things that I think they can maybe do differently, right? I, I think they're, they're, I'm almost going to say like what I've said about the Ravens. I think they need to become a run football team. Hmm. Run the ball, become great at running the football, and then all the other stuff's going to come off of it. But the, to me, it's the only thing that is blue chip worthy on their offense, other than Josh Allen, is their O line. So play through that, and that to me, I think, is what they need to reevaluate a little bit. Let's see if we can run, dominate the line of scrimmage. James Cook is playing really bad, and then some of these pass schemes that we do that not not, not necessarily are reinventing the wheel, or some of our guys that are not incredibly talented, I think get open more because teams are going to have to be worrying about this element. The best thing about their offense is their O-line other than Josh Allen. All right, so let's take a look at the screenshots here. We'll start with the very first drive. This was their first third down. It was third down and three. What are we looking at here? Third down and three, okay? This is the first third down of the game. They have a little bit of like a – it's Coleman down here on the bottom of the screen. He's running what we would call a spot route. He's hoping that the linebacker will run underneath him right here to help James Cook run the wheel route out of the backfield. He's the first read. This is cover one. This is what the play's for, okay? Josh Allen sees him, and for whatever reason, he's looking there right now, and he doesn't trust that James Cook is going to run by the linebacker here. And he should, and he should stay on this longer. That's right. The first thing as a quarterback, when you see the linebacker running ex- horizontal, right, yeah. exactly horizontal, and your running back is running full speed vertical, you, you, you know, he's seen this route enough to know, hey, he's going to run by him here, right? So we got to it. He's looking at him, and he gets off of him. Let's go to the next shot. He gets off of him, and he's running by him. I mean, he's gone. 
And, and, and trust me, if we took another screenshot a half a second later, he's five yards by him. Right. But you can see here, Allen has already left that decision and now is looking to the right to try to find somebody. One of the golden rules of football is, like, don't turn down completions. And, you know, when you miss number one as your read, it messes everything up. It messes everything up, and it's hard to find completions after that, after what we drew up was supposed to work, and you didn't you know, execute it the right way. Hard to know what he was thinking there. I, was... I, I feel like he was rushed this whole game. Like, he wasn't yeah. sure. They're, they're, of course, a very fast defense, right? They, they, their DNs did give the Bills problems and were around him a little bit. And I think in his mind, he thought, oh, I'm not going to have a lot of time for some of these plays to develop today, so I got to like see it and then get out of the pocket. And with doing that, yeah, he rushed everything. He rushed throws, he rushed decisions and all of that, and that kind of confounded itself into issues in a 6-for-18 first half that you're not supposed to see with a guy like Josh Allen. Very next drive, yep. it was a first and 20 after a penalty. Here is a attempt over to Mac Hollins. Well, uh, d- n- no, oh. you only get a few chances like this every no. game, right? They call – this is – the Houston Texans want to play cover one. They like to play man-to-man. They love to play quarters. So they played quarters, and they play like a little – like he's going to run an in-cut, right? A little like in-breaking route, and the safety has to be responsible for that. So he jumps it and then goes vertical, and he's wide open. But again, here's another one where I felt like even Josh Allen rushed this. Just the way he threw it, he kind of threw it frantically, and it was just like, no, your pocket's perfect. Calm down. Just throw it high, and down the middle of the field, he misses this. When you're not a real explosive offense, you know, you only get a few opportunities like this a game. And every – hey, all quarterbacks miss some of these big throws. Sure. But when you're Josh Allen and their stats look the way they are, and and you are a team – that, like I said, doesn't get open down the field all the time, yeah, there's a little bit more, you know, what do I want to say, pressure on these kind of moments for your football team. And I don't see Josh Allen miss wide open ones like this very often, so that had to be, uh, you know, pointed out. I mean, that, exactly, because you just don't see this that often. And we want to prove, too, that that you are not in the bag for Josh Allen if he has a bad game or doesn't see some stuff. We will point that out on the Chris Sims on Button podcast, like the 3rd and 13 later on in the game when Keon Coleman appears to be open. We, yeah. I mean, again, here the, the read is go left to right. If you have single safety, take your out route on 3rd and 13. You throw him the ball, right? And he throws the ball right now at him. He's going to catch the ball. He's going to turn up and get the first down. Instead, he gives it the quickest look in the world and doesn't really give it a chance. And then he comes back to the front side and there's nobody really open here. So then he's stuck. So yeah, again, turning down a a completion, you know, one that's easy. And there to me, things where I think he predetermined going, well, maybe I don't trust Keon Coleman all the way yet. And I like this on the front side. I think I'm going to get this. But like Houston passed it off a little bit different way than I think he expected because he wants to hit the middle of the three receivers on the bottom of the screen here, right? See that? Yeah. But they switched it off a little bit with the, between him and one. So now this guy's got inside leverage. And the guy in the middle of the three on the bottom of the screen is running. He's going to run like a slant route here in a second. He's going to follow that shallow cross and go right behind it. But the guy's waiting for for it because they know what's coming, mm-hmm. right? So, again, you can't turn down that completion, and there was just a little too much of that in uh, Allen's game altogether. And then I think when you compound that with a defensive line that's very fast and those defense ends, right, he can't outrun them and buy time like he can compared to other teams. So that ended like where he usually gets out of the pocket and is like, oh, I got a little time here to throw the ball. It was like, oh, gosh, they're on my back. Oh, throw it away, yeah. right? So he never got to get some easy completions like we see him do that every week when he scrambles and gets outside the pocket one more sequence to show and this is right at the end of the first half it was a second and 10 buffalo has the ball at their own 28 here yeah again i think over aggressive impatience here and again also a missed throw here this is empty formation he's got three receivers down here to the bottom of the screen it's uh i believe it's uh ty johnson on the bottom bottom here but in the slot okay we got the three to the right we got dalton kincaid in the middle of uh or in, in, in the inside of the three receivers yep and then there is curtis samuel in the middle of the three receivers and then it's ty johnson on the outside dalton kincaid's gonna run a post down the middle number one curtis samuel the middle of three receivers to your right is gonna run like a flag route right this play is for him and this coverage so let's go let's go to the next picture here you're gonna see again 
This is, to me, oh, it's my guy. He's one-on-one. I'm going to take a shot instead of going, wait, this scheme gives this coverage big problems, and we're going to high-load this corner down here in the bottom seat because the corner's like, wait, I'm responsible for 26, right. but they also don't want me to let anybody behind me to throw in this zone. And they got him, right, because you could see he took the cheese, the corner. So if Allen throws this ball after the 45-yard line to the sideline, I mean, it's, it's an easy completion. Derek Stingley's not that good that he's going to flip around and run back there and then flip back around and see the ball and do that. But having said all that, he plays the matchup down the middle and you see Kincaid, who's not open right here. He's step for step with the middle linebacker. And again, let me just remind you, the middle linebackers of the Houston Texans are the fastest in in football, right? With the Fred Warner and the guys from the Jets and all of that. So it's not like, oh, if he's even, he's leaving with a tight end. This isn't, you know, Jamison Williams. Yeah. Uh, so he takes a chance. He throws it. Let's show the next screen. Okay. He's got him here at this point, but he underthrows it and misses the throw. So one, I think it's a little bit of a greedy decision. Two, again, it's a throw where he was a little off. And that was, I think, really explained the day. The second half wasn't any better. The second half was one big run, a personal foul, and one throw, and they got a touchdown. And then it was, oh, no, we didn't do shit for three plays, and I threw a curl route to Keon Coleman, and he broke a tackle and ran for a touchdown. And then it was, we stripped C.J. Stroud on the four-yard line and got no yards and kicked a field goal, and that's how we came back. Mm -hmm. So, like, the second half, I wasn't like, oh, all right, that makes me feel better. Everything looked better. You saw my notes. One other thing I wrote in my notes, and let me just see where the hell I wrote it, is that about the, the the defense they played, um, you know, the the they at one point and where did I write this damn thing? Is they brought the all out blitz. Where the hell did I write that? Mm, I wrote see. it somewhere here. Hold on. Okay, yep, third and eleven, first page, right? I'm writing this a little bit here. And I still can't find it for whatever reason, but I'm getting there. Okay, here we go. Oh, on your own 29 in the first quarter. Oh, yeah, there it is. It says a lot. When a team all-out all blitzes you on third and 11 on your own 29 in the first quarter, right, that says a lot, right? It says a lot. One, one thing is it's telling you they don't want him to scramble because they're going, that's the worst thing that happens is when he scrambles and buys time, he's going to find somebody, right? That's his most dangerous thing. So there's that. But then it also tells you they're like, we have no fear of your offense or your receivers. We don't give a damn. We don't think your answers are that good against the all-out blitz. And we think if you just run your play and you kind of somewhat block the all-out blitz, we're going to be all over it anyways. Mm -hmm. And that those, to me, are context clues that defenses feel very comfortable. This is the same shit we talked about with the Broncos versus Aaron Rodgers, right? Oh, we know what they're going to do. Who cares? Well, all oh, blitz the first play of the game. We don't really care. Right? Because we know it's going to be something simple and, you know, we're not necessarily all that scared of them. And I think that goes into play here. And, uh, yeah, to me, that is the big thing with them. I think they need to become a, more of a running football team. And maybe like, like Lamar and company, check, check that at the door, do that, and then everything you want on offense will hopefully come after that. Because the pressure on the pass rush has certainly affected Josh Allen in this passing attack the last couple of weeks. They handled it pretty well the first three weeks of the season. Last two weeks now, just a 20% completion percentage when pressured. That is worst in the NFL. They got the Jets coming up Monday night football. Yeah. Could I they have a blueprint? On how to uh, how to negatively affect Josh Allen. Well, uh, y yes, I mean they're gonna the Jets do what they do, right? They're one of those football teams, but their talent is phenomenal, and I would expect the Bills and their offense to struggle unless they can find a San Francisco 49ers like running game that they did in the first week, right? But. You know, if you think you're going to drop back against this crew and dice them up with Josh Allen and all that, and, and I, I don't see that. Not with this secondary, not with this pass rush, right? And this is another defense that he will not be able to scramble and buy as much time of because they're so fast. They're, they're capable of corralling him and stopping him from waiting that extra half a second for somebody to get open. Qualifies for the Pick 6 podcast because we never see. We never see Josh Allen struggle like that. we got to figure out why it happened. And number four, we also really never see Kyle Shanahan struggle. Certainly to score some points when you get into the red zone, but that has been an issue for the 49ers. We move on to number four of the Pick 6. The 49ers red zone struggles. Derek Weatherford 
Howard said, are Shanahan's passing and route concepts too basic? Why does he get so pass happy in games? Thanks. So trying to figure out what has gone wrong with the 49ers red zone offense. So before you get into your answer to Derek right there, thanks, Derek, for sending that in. Great picture of you and the misses there on your Twitter profile. Great picture. Uh, 49ers red zone offense rank total play. So they have a lot of experience this year. They have, they have the most red zone plays that, in the NFL really? wow. with 67. Okay. The red zone conversion percentage, 29th in the NFL uh, at 41%. Again, I don't know the stats, right? I just – these are things that you guys hear me say out loud, and I go, the 49ers can't score touchdowns. That's I mean, just, that's goal just, to go is – yeah, even worse. I know. And that's where, you know, I, I of course have always in a vested interest in watching the Niners and have great feel for their football team. I'm always got a little bit more of an eye on them than maybe other teams when their games are on. And I, it's definitely something that jumped out to me this year. It's just damn, it's down there a lot, kicking field goals a lot. And that's not usually the way with Shanahan and, and their offense. Now, hey, not having McCaffrey, you could certainly say that's part of it. Ayuk not being his total self the first few weeks of the year certainly hurt it. He dropped a touchdown or two, right? Brock Purdy has been off down there for whatever reason. Mm-hmm. I think the, uh, the biggest thing is just this from a, a, a plain and simple standpoint. Once you get inside the 10, it's hard to run it in the end zone in the NFL anymore. You know, it's just it's it's this field is too small and the safeties have become so good and so kamikaze that when they don't have anything to worry about that behind them on the 10 yard line. Right. As soon as they see like this, they're like, oh, oh, he's got the ball. I'm flying down and into the hole. I mean, safeties are more kamikaze now than ever. So it's hard to run the ball in that part of the end zone. I will say our listener. Right. If there's something that I would say is a weak point for Shanahan and his offense, I would say drop back pass game is probably the thing I'm least impressed with sometimes. And and again, it's not like some of the other offenses I'm talking about, but I'm just saying he's a magician in everything else he does. Mm -hmm. But I also think, yeah, that, that, that part of their offense could be better. And then I also think within the red zone in these areas, this is, you know, most years, the best red zone quarterbacks are the guys that are the best quarterbacks because they can make throws and put you know steam and miles per hour on the ball and tight windows in a short field that just other guys can't, right? Whether that's been Aaron Rodgers in his prime or Brady in his prime, you know, Josh Allen most years, not this year, right? Uh, they're, they're, those are the type of guys that thrive in that area because – yeah, the windows are tighter, and your ability to throw lasers into those tight windows gives your team much more of an advantage to score a touchdown. You know, and that's where Brock Purdy's not a laser guy. He's not that. Let alone, like I said, there's you saw in my notes, there's a few plays where he missed throws where you just go, oh, that should have been a touchdown, and he missed it. So you add that up, some turnovers, some, oh, we got down there in the Vikings game and got stopped on fourth and goal and didn't score at all there, or we've had to kick the field goals and all that, and it's led to an underwhelming performance. And you always wonder whether this is just, even though they have 67 plays down there and we are accumulating some sample size, yeah. is it still small sample size in the red zone? Is it just one play here, a penalty here, a dropped IU pass there, and if you make those two plays, all of a sudden, instead of 31st in the league, you're like mid-pack. Yeah, I, I mean, you're right. It doesn't take much to change this narrative, but in, in, a, in, a, in a league where it's close as hell, those are the difference in, oh, we beat the Rams, or we beat the Cardinals. Instead, we lost, because we settled. So, yeah, those two or three times, right, it can be improved, certainly, and they have the potential to do that. But as it looks right now, you know, and just let me hit some of my notes here, yep. right? Got to find some ways to throw in the end zone, right? Uh, it's always some sort of Shanahan gadget play that gets him in the end zone. It's never just like a basic red, red zone drop back pass play to the point of our listener there, Derek Weatherford, right? It's an it's a inside screen to the tight end with Kittle. It's a reverse to Debo or something like that. It's a screen to Debo with blockers out in front of him. It's very rarely like, hey, he drops back and throws a ball on rhythm, boom, in the end zone, touchdown, right? There, there's just, it's very rarely that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, let me just see. You know, I talked about the run game too close. Third, yeah, I mean, I think I hit most of it. Is there anything else there you think I missed? I mean, I was, I was listening to you, yes, yeah. but I was also perusing around because I was just curious how they do last year. Right. How they do last year in the red yeah, zone. Yeah, what, what, what was it? They were first in the NFL. Yeah. Number there you, one. There you go. Scoring a touchdown 67% of the time. So that, that's a big thing. And, again, people ask, like, what's the deal 
how big of a deal is McCaffrey? And I go, mm -hmm. it's a huge deal. Mm -hmm. It's huge. Not only is he the best player on their offense, he's their number one schematical disadvantage, right? Or, you know, advantage compared to the defense. So, and as I, I, like I tell people, and I said this on Football Night in America, all right, so some of these Jordan Mason runs that would be a 50-yard run, he hits 70-yard touchdown for McCaffrey. That's leaving some points on the board. Mm -hmm. And the other aspect of this, and I've had defensive coordinators tell me this, like with McCaffrey in the game, they have a totally different play sheet on defense. They have to call the game completely different. When he's not in, it's a totally different play sheet. There's so many things they don't have to worry about. McCaffrey's versatility in lining up in the slot or running routes out of the backfield and doing all that is a headache with how Shanahan packages it all together. And right now, teams don't have to worry about that. And so one of their greatest advantages has been chopped out from underneath them until he gets healthy, and uh, you know that, that's a problem too. Tomorrow at Seattle, Ooh. I'll tell you what, big early game, Seattle right now on top of the NFC West. Yeah, definitely. All right, here's one other thing too. Yep. Right, I talked about Purdy missing wide open throws. Purdy, you know, he's definitely a little too conservative, I think, at times down there. I, I do think he could pull the trigger in a few situ situations. As part, that's part of the problem. Uh, yeah, a little too careful, conservative. And then I, I talked about, you know, the, the arm. And definitely a little more frantic in the pocket in the red zone as compared to the regular field, if that makes sense. Yep. You know, again, I think, you know, people feel like, oh, I don't want to make a negative play. I don't want to do anything bad here in the red zone, right? You hear that from your coaches all the time and sometimes can rush you out of the pocket and decision making because you have your coach in your ear go, we don't want to lose it. We don't take a sack. We don't, we don't want to make the field goal harder. Blah, blah, blah. You have all these damn things in your head and it doesn't allow you to play freely. But uh, I think we hit it all there. Yeah, a little struggle for Brock Purdy, but the 49ers still believe in their quarterback. Do the Pittsburgh Steelers still believe in their quarterback? Should they? You took a look at uh, Justin Fields and also more specifically that Cowboys defense that has become pretty good against the run, at least the teams they've played the last couple weeks. Right. Plus, we look at how your preseason predictions are going. Uh -oh. Who's good? Who's bad? I know I'm pretty bad. I'm bad. That's coming up next. It is the biggest game we have ever had in the history of Big Ten Saturday Night yes, on NBC. The number two team in the country, the Ohio State Buckeyes, in Eugene, Oregon, taking on the number three team in the country, Oregon Ducks. Wow, and we know who you'll be rooting for as a Michigan fan. <laughs> oh, I'm you very unbiased, impartial. You unbiased I'm, member of the media. I had the Michigan. We were we had Michigan Washington last week. Yes, and I found myself. You know, when I'm not working, I'm rooting for Michigan yeah. for sure. Yeah, I got you. I found myself like loving that environment so much. The story of Washington. Yep. And Michigan being like, you know what? They won it last year. They don't have the same team this year. Right. I think it's a cool story that Washington won that game. So yeah, I can put okay. my fandom okay. aside. All right. Well, well said. Well, way to way to bull crap your way through that <laughs> yeah. there. But no, well, I'm pumped for this oh my game gosh. too. Yeah. Ohio State, uh, just real quickly. I mean, we know Oregon's good mm -hmm. and Dylan Gabriel at quarterback, right? They kind of got off to a sluggish start. They've been better the last few weeks. Dylan Gabriel, I think, you know, we can question maybe some of his throws and decisions and all that. They're going to be facing a different animal this week. And I mean that in the most respectful way possible because Ohio State is, again, I'm, I'm new to like evaluating college football on a weekly basis, right? But th it's one of the most talented teams I can remember watching. I mean, they're stacked and they don't do anything. They're so good. They're literally like, we're just going to play cover one the whole game. Good luck. Yeah. And like 4-3 cover one. We don't care that our linebacker or our safety on the slot. We don't care. I mean, they're, they're that good. They haven't even been tested. I don't think they've had a game yet that has raised their blood pressure. No. This will be the first time you're going to see them go on the field with the aspect of we could maybe lose this game if we don't play good, and I think you're going to see Ohio State you know, play at a high level because of that. Hopefully Oregon can match that. By all accounts, Ohio State has a 18 to $20 million team. That's yeah. how much it costs, basically, right. to keep this team together. Yeah. Some guys who could have gone pro decided to come back, yep. and a la Michigan last year trying to, to win a national championship. So we'll have that for you. Our coverage begins 7 Eastern. Notre Dame-Stanford before that yep. on NBC as well. All right, welcome back to Chris Sims Unbuttoned, presented by Lowe's. Lowe's knows home improvement. And the Cowboys no winning, at least the last couple of weeks here. Number five in our pick six. Uh, it's a little combo platter here. 
because you looked at both the, the the Cowboys' defensive side of the ball, yeah. Justin Fields on the offensive side of the ball. Yeah. Uh, Rolling Sevens tweeted us and said, Fields isn't the primary issue with the offense, and Wilson doesn't solve anything Fields isn't bringing. The issue is only one NFL-caliber wide receiver on the whole roster, a substitute teacher at running back, and an offensive line decimated by injury. Yeah, I, I, think, there's, I, I think that's fair there. Now, you know, whether Russell Wilson could add more to the passing game – you know that that to me is, is is a fair question. It is. Now, I, I mean, Fields has continued to do things the right way for the most part. You've heard me kind of wax poetically about him for the first few weeks of the year. Last week was the first time I looked at it that I went, uh, I feel like we saw old Justin Fields a little bit. You know, the Denver game wasn't pretty early on in the year either, but that Denver defense was real and it's early season and you're getting used to things on the offensive side of the ball, as we've talked about. I mean, teams are just kind of hitting their stride now on the offensive side of the ball. But there was some things in that game the other night that, yeah, are concerning. And there was plays and people open and throws that were missed or whatever where I just go, damn, like we, we can't do that. When you're Justin Fields and you're hanging on to your job by a thread and there's a guy that yes historically has definitely been a better thrower than you on the sideline like definitely right and then then last year too even though it wasn't maybe up to everybody's standards it still was better than Justin Fields throwing the ball this is the kind of thing that cracks the door open for everybody to go "Eh, should we play the other guy and you know I think that and then of course playing a cowboy defense that's not necessarily one of the top defenses in football and then having a hard time moving the ball throughout the night yeah it has opened the door for that conversation and I, I wouldn't be shocked if we saw Russell Wilson starting quarterback this week I would not so what was the worst game that you've seen from fields so far definitely definitely there's no doubt about that I mean you can you can go to the first game the first throw of the game right I mean could have been a better throw off target yeah the guy could have caught it he had a, a seam route uh, early in the first drive where he's got the big big tight end from Georgia Washington running down the middle of the field he doesn't even give him a chance to get a hand on the ball it's it's made for him the bat the guy covering him's back's turn just throw it at his head he's gonna catch it like every tight end does in football and there's not going to be any problems there all right so there's that there's missed throws I'll get into some other throws their O-line like it doesn't it's not nothing special Okay, that, that's what I would say. I certainly don't look at it and go, anybody is blue chip there or dominant in one area or this side of the line's really good. I don't see that. They've graded out okay, according to Pro Football Focus. Right, that offensive right. Line. So they've graded out okay. Uh, and, and I'm not surprised by that because it's not like it's bad, but it's just not overwhelmingly good. Sure. And I think what makes it worse is this aspect, and you're not going to be surprised by this. I haven't done this all day. Oh, just for it's our back, listeners. let alone pounding on the table. Yes, I'm doing both at the same time. <laughs> The, I think the other thing that compounds it is their running backs are so blah. I mean, they're just blah. I mean, it, it's for a team that talks about wanting to run the ball, you'd think they'd try to go out and get a dynamic runner every now and then. Warren's been hurt, right? Yeah, Warren is their dynamic runner, and he's been dealing with a leg issue at the, ever since the, the preseason. So it, that, that hurts. And even he... I, I still don't go, oh, my gosh, I'm so amazed by him. I'm just – he's the best one of that group. But what they got there right now, I mean, you, you've heard what I've said. And to me, um, Najee Harris looks slower this year than he has in past years. Hmm. They're just – he gets you nothing extra other than when it's third – he should be the third down back. That should be all there is to it. That, that's what I, I have to say about it. So that, that adds to that as well. Right. But, yeah, there is – concerning plays and throws uh, by Justin Fields that certainly need to be better. And I'm sure they watched that film and they went, oh, that wasn't very good. And can Russell Wilson help us out and make us better? So it would have helped Justin Fields if they would have had a running game. They could not for some of the reasons you just laid out right there. But for the Cowboys, it hasn't really mattered in – this season yeah. if the other team can run the ball well or not we've right. seen teams gash them yeah last two weeks hasn't been the case Definitely. Giants tried to run the ball and now the Steelers trying to do it maybe the talent maybe the running back but do you give some credit to the Cowboys defense defensive line stepping up I do I think there's a little bit like to what you said the Steelers and the Giants were not ready to write home and go well they stopped the greatest shows on turf there yeah. right they're they're average offenses at best okay I think there's that aspect 
there's on both offenses like only one guy you really got to worry about neighbors or pickens okay and pickens isn't as good as neighbors okay so that that can we can settle that right there you know t- running backs that are not necessarily oh my gosh they're so good right it's the giants and the steelers i think are underwhelming at the running back position nobody's scared of them when they're game planning all right but there are some things to look at at the Cowboys day. One, Mike Zimmer definitely is tricking it up a little bit more. Remember a few weeks ago, I went, it's just too Mike Zimmer simple, and everybody knows it. There's more defenses being called. There's a little more variety. That's for sure. I think the other thing, too, is the um, is the D tackles are playing better. Mozzie Smith popped in the game a few times. Wow. Like, Mozzie Smith actually had a few plays where I was like, wait, who's this <laughs> moving people? Oh, my gosh, it's Mozzie Smith. I'm used to watching him on skates going backwards. He's so he's playing with a little fire under his ass and a physicality. So that was impressive. Carlos Watkins, Lindell Joseph looks like he's in shape. So I think they got some guys that are, you know, maybe comfortable in the scheme um, and playing a little bit better. That's helping them out as well. Let alone, like I said, Zimmer's doing a little more on defense uh, the, to keep people on edge. Um, so, um, th- so yes, I'm seeing Pete is writing something in oh, here. Okay. Uh, as we speak, right. breaking news, he can change the rundown. Um, he, oh, no. he, some Twitter film watchers are saying that yeah. George Pickens was loafing at times during the game. Did you see any of that? I don't see, I didn't see loafing. I mean, Pickens is a little bit of a guy. I mean, again, at time, if the run goes away, he might not hustle all the way. If he's, you know, runs down the field and realizes he's double covered. He kind of pulls up, right? He's like, oh, the ball's not coming to me. Does he do some of that? Yeah, certainly. All right. But, you know, I, I do think his attitude and body language should change a little bit. That's for sure. So back to the Cowboys defense. So this is, this is the Cowboys, though, the last few years, right? They, they eat against teams that are either fringe playoff teams You're or right. not playoff teams at all. You're right, right? About And the that. question for them is once the – Can they beat the cream of the crop? Exactly. Exactly right. And I don't know that either, but either way, I, I give them a lot of credit for being tough, physical, the hell with my injuries, and that, that hey, the Jones, I've been – you know, critical of them before too, but their ability to draft and build a team and kind of develop guys that we don't know or haven't heard about coming up the ranks and all that, that, that you got to give them credit in that department for sure. Our Demarion Overshawn, number 13, yeah. is playing a whole better, a whole lot better. We know he's a freak show athletically, but he's, you could tell it's like the lights have turned on, like he knows what he's supposed to do. The other one that is, I think, an improvement for them is the kid from Notre Dame, the rookie, the linebacker, right? They're not playing some of the guys that I complained about early in the year at middle linebacker. Uh, Mar- Maris Leofau, Le- 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 right? Le- he, he adds some physicality to their defense. Yeah. You've heard me make fun of their middle linebackers and do all that. Now they got those two in there with Kendricks, right? And they're definitely better in that department. So I think those are... Those are, uh, you know, in, in part, important improvements for, for that Cowboys defense. Cowboys have a test at home taking on the Detroit Lions coming up this Sunday. Steelers at the Raiders. Would you, if you were Mike Tomlin, start Russell Wilson? Whew. Sounds like he's back, full participant at practice, I think starting today. I don't know what to say here. This is it. it so, so here's my – I think this is what's playing into my mind a little bit is the fact that – They've kind of wanted Russell Wilson to start the whole year. Mm -hmm. They wanted to keep Justin Fields on ice and then maybe make him the quarterback of the future, Mm. right? That's their master plan. And from what I've always heard or told is that just, yeah, that Russell Wilson's outperformed him in practice. And the fact that they wouldn't name Justin Fields the starter or the guy, I think what, in my mind, like just trying to connect between the tea leaves and all of that, right, Mm -hmm. is that, like, it's been overwhelmingly Russell Wilson's been better at practice than Justin Fields. When I when I hear stuff like that, like it's three and zero, and we still don't want to make him a starter, and you know it's three and one, and he played pretty good in that three th- that first loss, and we still don't want to make him a starter. And uh, to me, that's I guess that's what makes me question: Is there more there? This and then I'm a little bit recency biased because this game was ugly. I mean, it was ugly. He he missed wide open players and throws and decisions uh, that you know an offensive coordinator is going to come away and go. Gosh, I don't know if I can trust him. Right. So, I think of what I would do. What I would say is I'd I'd probably go one more week with Justin Fields. I'd go one more week, and if I don't see drastic improvement or feel like we're playing at a high level and it's a Raiders football team that I feel like we can beat, then I go to Russell Wilson. 
Yeah. But but there also could be the object of maybe this is a good week for Russell Wilson to get in there. We feel like we match up well with them, right? They're going to play a defensive struggle type of football game as well in this one where I don't expect a ton of points between the Steelers and Raiders, so we'll see where this goes. Early indication it, it's, a it's tough one there, Justin man. Fields, but like I mentioned, yeah, Wilson, uh, full participant in practice, uh, so he is back fully. Yeah, early indications are it's Fields, though, right? We haven't heard anything so. else, or I, I haven't so. heard anything from anybody that I know that's, that's substantial to, to think that – it's being made a switch right now, but you know today is the day we'll, we would hear. Later today is when we're definitely going to hear on a Wednesday evening, right when practice is over or mm-hmm. when they get out for the early part of the, the practice and start warming up. One thing we know for sure, yeah. they're going to finish 9-8. and eight. They're going to make the playoffs. We don't even know, we don't know who the quarterback's going to be, yeah. but we know that because that's what they do every year. Number right. six is our Lowe's homie team picks. What it's up, homies? You guys, 665 of you back in September made your playoff predictions. Uh, so let's go through some of them right now and see yeah. how they're how they're faring, how, how you're looking out there, the majority of the masses. Uh, 97% of you had the Chiefs winning the division. Right. Uh, I think you're looking pretty good on that one. 80% of you had the Eagles winning the NFC East. I don't know about that. Yeah. Commanders I mean, I still like fight. it, but it's mm-hmm. it's it's going to be close here. It is. 78% the 49ers winning the West. Ooh, I don't they know got there. some work to do right they now. They better win on Thursday night. 69% said the Texans would win the South. Still feel good about that do for sure. Do feel good about that one. 65% said the Falcons to win the NFC South. That's up for grabs, but I still I feel good about that. To this me, them week. and the Bucks, mm-hmm. you know, with the way the Saints are falling off and now Derek Carr being hurt, yeah. certainly. Only 63% of you had the Lions. I mean, that's still the majority of people thought the Lions would win the NFC North, but now they are two games behind the – or a game and a half, I guess, behind the Minnesota Vikings. Yeah, well, damn, it's a good division. It's better than I think we all even gave it credit for, it too. I guess what, what that's saying is some people out there saw that there was some, some better competition in the division. The consensus pick to win the AFC North, the Cincinnati Bengals, 53% of you, now the last-place team. Yeah, in the AFC North, along <laughs> right. with the Cleveland Browns. That's a Cleveland team I had in the playoffs, and I think you did. You have Cleveland in the playoffs? I or no? believe I did. I don't Hopefully think not. I did this year. I you did. Didn't. Oh, damn, I did. Cincinnati, damn, I did damn. not have in the playoffs, and yeah. you had them hoisting the Lombardi Trophy at the yeah, end, as, as Devin McCourty likes to bring up every single every time show. on Football Night in America. Yep, I'm in trouble. There's no doubt about that. I mean, the the AFC North to a degree is. Uh, yeah, been a little disappointing with the Bengals and the Browns specifically. You know, mm-hmm. The Ravens are certainly turning into what we thought they were, and then the Steelers are, like you said, look like the same old Steelers. It's interesting. The AFC East, the last division we haven't talked about here, was the wow. most competitive according to the wow. homies. It was Jets was the 40% pick. That was actually number one. Bills, 35% of you picked that. Dolphins, 25%. And the Patriots actually did not get one single out of the 665 entries. Not I still one like pick I still like the Jets, the honestly. I do. Dang. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? I I, I think I would take the Jets I mean, right now. If that now. does happen, yeah. Ulbrich is the guy. I would have to think. I I, I right? would think so Wouldn't too. You think unless... I, I would think. Unless it's just like they get a sense that maybe Aaron Rodgers is going to retire after the year and they just want to start new all together. I don't know. But yeah, if they get in the playoffs and make the little waves, you're right. It's, it, he will be the guy. So the Vikings are five and zero. Oh. But only 3.6% of the homies picked them to even make the playoffs. Wow. Two homies picked them to win the NFC North. No one picked them to reach the NFC Championship game. But congratulations to the two homies out there who picked them to win the NFC North. Incredible. Well done. It is. One was Mike Florio. No, I don't know. <laughs> well, we should get the names for that if there's only two. Uh, maybe next podcast we'll, we'll go through that. Pete's got all the uh, the spreadsheet and all that stuff. Yep, so. yep. Um, Super so, Bowl winners is the one that's, you know, people so are Super in Bowl there. winners, yeah. Chiefs were the most popular pick. 49ers, sure. second most popular. Bengals, third most popular. Wow. Both of those are, are big trouble dicey right at now. this point. Yes. Packers in there, Ravens in there. Ravens looking pretty good. Uh, Jeff Rowland. Yeah. And Rob Taglia. I okay. feel like I've said the name Rob Taglia. He might be a homie who's tweeted us before, right? Has he not? Congratulations. So, so Jeff and Rob, are you Vikings fans? What happened there? Tweet at us, and we will read your response. Okay. After the Vikings game this uh, this Sunday against, they had the guts. They had playing. the guts where it's like, you know, I'm a huge fan of both those coaches up in Minnesota, but I was just like, ah, I gotta see it with Sam Darnold a little bit, and. Man, is the defense going to be that much better? We'll see and all that. I should have had more faith in uh, O'Connell and Flores. They'll be undefeated after this week as well because the Vikings are on a bye. <laughs> all right, we finish this with the buzz watch. Yeah. We say goodbye. These bzz, are the bzz. team's players, the biggest opportunity to create the biggest buzz this week. Last week we had three. All three of those teams or players did not live up 
did not take advantage of the buzz they could have created. Now, yeah. for the Jaguars, that was actually good yeah. because the buzz was them to you lose. You were buzzing for them to get fired <laughs> here. Exactly. <laughs> Doug Peterson hot seat, but they did get a win there. And so we'll see. We'll see if any of these teams this week can uh, – can Baker, create that Baker buzz. Mayfield and the Bucks had their chance to create oh, they the did, buzz, right? And, yep. the and the Bengals almost were, won in Baltimore. I mean, yes, yes, blew that one. Yes, they did. So, so you, were, you were very close there. Hopefully, this first one, the uh, Cowboys blow it yep. because I once again think the Cowboys, if they beat the Lions, and here we go, all of a sudden, a team that we thought like, oh man, this team is you know, defensively can't stop anyone. If they beat the Lions and stop that running game, then we'll be like, okay, something definitely has changed. Uh, with this team, I don't disagree with you there. It, it'll make it make us all think a little differently. And then if they do it without Michael Parsons and Demarcus Lawrence again and get another win that way, that would even be more shocking as well. But yeah, this would be one to go. Okay, all right, maybe we were wrong. Dallas is a little better than we thought they were. Uh, and that would be big news if they beat the Lions. And despite Dan Skipper properly reporting eligible, the Lions <laughs> lose again to the Cowboys. Would be the headline of that one. Uh, number two. This is a negative. Oh. Bengals lose to your Giants Sunday night football. They are now on their last leg. One coach already fired after a disappointing first quarter of the season. Does the heat get turned up on Zach Taylor? Ooh. That's it, the buzz. The Not heat will like be that. turned up on them altogether if they go into New York and lose again. It, it will be all everybody questioning everything there. I don't think it gets to the point where we're talking about Zach Taylor being fired. I don't. You know, because again, last year, by all due accounts, looked like they were on their way to being a real pain in the ass at the mm -hmm. end of the season and into the playoffs, and then Joe Burrow got hurt. So this will be you know, the year that we looked at as bad, and then it'll be like, hey, you're put on notice for next year. But I, I don't imagine anything happening with Zach Taylor right are, now. Are we going into the notebook here during uh, the middle of buzz watch here, Pete? Because you did look at that Joe Burrow interception versus Baltimore, right? Did you, yeah. wanna, you looked at it. You might as well make a comment Okay, here. well, yeah, just, you know, you heard I, – I, this is why I love Jamar Chase. He blamed himself, right? Oh, okay. He, he took it on the chin like a, like a man and said he ran a bullshit-ass route or something for yep. Burrow, right? It was not a great route. It was not. Um, Marlon Humphrey made a great play, but I think if we show it and you want to show it here, bring sure. it up, is the fact that, all right, he's got man-to-man -man at the top of the screen. You see that, right? Marlon Humphrey's playing inside of him a little bit, okay? So he's wanting to stop the slant or anything like that. So let's go. Let's go to the next screen, next shot. You're going to see. Now, this is where Jamar Chase went a little wrong. He didn't really give any vertical, let me scare you that I might run by you, right? Yeah. He kind of did a little shuffle with his feet at the line of scrimmage and then just broke inside. So he never got Marlon Humphrey to go, oh, wait, I got to turn. He's about to go and, and didn't create that space. Look on the bottom of the screen. If you see T. Higgins on the bottom, he's running the same exact route. Yeah. He threatened with the go route on the outside. The guy turned, and now he's turning back, and you can see T. Higgins is open if he throws it down here on the bottom. But instead, he throws it up top where he could have thrown it to Yosebas uh, in the flat, yeah. honestly. But I understand you're playing your best player. It's man-to-man, -man, and he ran a bad route. He didn't get across the face of Marlon Humphrey, who made an incredible catch, really, you know, with, with Jamar Chase hanging all over him. But, yeah, that's one that'll, that'll bother Jamar Chase because he's run that route perfectly nine zillion times in his life youtube commenter uh the zilly yeah what up, commented zilly? on our last show saying burrow will become the new marino if he stays with the bengals his entire career well, oh boy we'll, we'll see I hopefully mean, not but we'll see marino's doing a lot of commercials though it wouldn't be the worst thing ever he's made a lot of money <laughs> he's doing all right number one number one team that has an opportunity to create the biggest buzz the washington commanders created I, a lot already I but boy agree. oh boy if Ooh. they beat the ravens Ooh. cinderella is finding her slipper looks more likely the commanders have a permanent spot at the ball in their future if they can get a win here. i i uh, yes like we, we've all been like oh my gosh the washington is better oh my gosh Jaden daniels is amazing it's all true too but if they beat the Ravens, who I, I will say, when the Ravens are at their best, to me, certainly are in the conversation for the best team in football. I, I have no doubt about that. And, and I think we'll see more of their best here going forward rather than, you know, Raiders meltdown or not so good in the first half of the Chiefs in game one. But it, it, it's, it, their, their best is the cream of the crop. So that will make me think differently. And – you know, they have some things, too, that I think, you know, are going to be issues for Washington altogether. If they pull this out and he plays well, Jaden Daniels, it's like, it's wow, we've gone beyond past good rookie season, and now it's like completely like, wow, is Jaden Daniels the leader in the MVP race? That That's where we're going to be at, and yeah. that's really rare to be saying that. One, about Washington right now, and then two, about a rookie quarterback. One of the best stories in the NFL. All right, we gave one homie's 
comment from YouTube. We try to do this every podcast. Yep. Let's show a couple more here that uh, we really do appreciate when you guys comment in, give a like, give a thumbs up. Uh, man, it was late for the editing team. Shout out to them, certainly. We were here till what? Almost 1 o'clock yeah, when almost, we left. Yep. I know. I got home that, about one thirty five, one forty 140 in the morning. And then I and then I feel bad because we just we walk away and Pete's sitting there kind of like putting the finishing touches on the pod. <laughs> I don't know when Pete leaves. It could be like three hours later. But Pete, we appreciate that as well. And the editing team for putting it all together. Uh, this is 4RM Deck 2 Free. I always knew I liked Chris Sims, and knowing he's 420 friendly proves my longtime intuition. Yeah, so there right. you go. You yep. got, a, hey, you got hey, a friend. Hey there, buddy. That's right. You know I like 420. 28 likes on that, too. And <laughs> I took a shot of whiskey every time Chris said bangles as I passed away. <laughs> I'm sorry. Right, so, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, let alone the bangles, you know, have <laughs> lost again. It's not worth dying over, okay? So don't, let's not let's not <laughs> die over bangles, okay? Oh, no, I gotta, I'm going to get bangles. I'm, I'm one of these days. I'll work on it. And you notice behind us, yeah. so uh, Terry Leopold, who basically runs NBC Sports around here. Right. I mean, she's just like this building. Anything yeah. that happens in this building, Terry knows about it, and she's made it happen. There's a blood drive happening today, and so yeah. you just got to go down the hallway. So a good reminder to all the homies out there, if you're able to and feel up to it, uh, you can do a lot of good by donating some blood. You, you're damn right you can do a lot of good. Hey, this asshole you're listening to right now wouldn't be here if people didn't donate blood. Uh, I mean, I had blood, tr blood transfusion when I lost my spleen. Nine, nine pints of my blood were mm. for other people. I actually got to meet the other people who gave me their blood. Wow, really? It was actually a no-no, but they broke the rule for me. No way. That day. And, uh, yeah, about, I would say, a year later, I met all of them at a blood drive. And, uh, yeah, it was very cool. It really oh, was. Oh, that is Very awesome. thankful. Yeah, but that's something you certainly can do to help out humanity. Donate some blood. People are always in need. Hospitals are always in need. So uh, goodbye, NBC. They're taking the lead on, on blood donations. Cool. All right. All right. And we with did that. It. And We're with done. that, we are done. Thursday, week six picks with Florio. Come and listen. I break down the games great. Don't necessarily listen to me what I'm picking right now because I am not worth a damn picking games. I'm not. I'm, I'm cold as hell. Uh, I'm trying to right, right, the, right my wrongs here, but I have yet to do it. Can you just okay? quit? Can you just quit? No, I cannot quit. They still want me to do the podcast. But you know where to find us tomorrow with Florio on the week six, week six podcast, PFT Chris Sims Unbuttoned Collaboration. I will be back with my man Ahmed Farid on Sunday night. As always, enjoy the weekend. Enjoy Thursday night football, 49ers Seahawks. Check us out, Ohio State, Oregon on Saturday night. Big Ten Saturday Rough. night on NBC. Notre Dame, Stanford before that. And then Sunday will be awesome. Get at us. You know where to find us. Peace out, homies. Clap it Clap up. Clap it up. Do you have something at all? At I've been like a little bit back on my uh, my my hip rehab thing. Yeah. On Wednesdays. Yeah. It is. I want to keep doing my workouts with my daughter, and then um, you know, because I like the way it makes me feel. Right. But I, I really notice like my hip is what affects my back. It's my it's my back problems are all from when my hip is weak or. It's funny. It's so yeah, deferred pain. And I have something out of place. Hmm. My femur is not in my hip socket the right way. Yeah. That's what the guy thinks. He thinks when I told you about it, remember that story about when I had Yo, yo, homies. Thanks for watching. Yeah, it's time. The NFL season is here on Chris Sims Unbuttoned. You can hit subscribe to get all the weekly picks, plus our Sunday recaps as the games are happening. Oh, you know it. Nobody does that better than us. Thanks again for watching. Remember to subscribe. Peace out. We'll see you next time on Unbuttoned.